as incredible wealth during those days? Oh, yeah. Um, did you know that around the Saqqara Pyramid, the Step Pyramid, and in front of the Second Pyramid, there was a quartz crystal floor that was maybe eight inches thick, maybe a little thicker than that. And uh, during the 1700s and prior to that in the 700s, those floors were just quarried. People were allowed to go on the plateau and just take stones to build mosques and churches and whatever they wanted. And there are a few chunks, and if you look up close, you'll see that they actually break into quartz crystals. Um, it's a, pardon? It's exciting stuff. It really, I mean, really, it really is. And then basalt floors, and you can see that they used to be polished. And they're in pretty good shape considering how old they are. And these were like really solid structures. And a lot of people go to Egypt and stand right on these floors and stand in front of the pyramid and don't even notice. And so I've got some pretty good footage of these structures. But also around the wall, uh, in, if you're looking at the step pyramid, you can see a few uraeus that were left. Well, they had... Uh, ruby eyes, and there's probably, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine of them, but they used to go all the way around this huge courtyard that had a quartz crystal floor. I mean, the opulence was incredible. Now, there's a lot of speculation about whether or not the Great Pyramid had a capstone, and it's my understanding now that it hasn't had a capstone for a long time, but when the casing stones were on there, in the distant past, it actually had a gold capstone that shimmered in its own, had its own energy, and that was part of how the uh, the, the uh, pyramid functioned as well. Robbers so, got the capstone. Uh, do I don't think? know. I don't know about that. I think it was such a long time ago; it could have been taken off because, again, the energy was shifting and things went into the etheric plane. I mean, all of this sounds a bit far out, but um, I really think that there were stages that are so beyond what we can understand if we're looking with our own patriarchal lenses. Um, I wouldn't say it was robbers. Um, I would say it was a decision that took it off. But the other thing is that the incredible amount of gold, I mean, even during the Amarna period, but the furniture that was buried with King Tut, there was a tremendous amount of gold. Now, probably they were um, transmuting other substances through the use of alchemy and creating the gold, um, there's information about that as well, the transmutation of the atom that was, you know, they weren't just mining it, if you will, because it's kind of like electroplating. But, uh, yeah, the jewels and the crystals and the stonework and all of that were signs of huge wealth and uh, opulence, beautiful stuff. Let's talk about the Pyramid Code. Now, keep in mind, Carmen, Zahi Hawass probably has his ear to his radio somewhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but tell me, tell me a little bit about the Pyramid Code. What is the code? Well, first of all, I have to send Zahi a copy because that was one of the conditions that I got the permit to. Ah, okay. Egypt. So he's going to see it. It's um, on the way, Zahi. It's on the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been finished that long, so I'm not overdue sending it. Um, okay, so what it is is a documentary series of five television hours. And uh, each episode is distinct, and it's going through the process. The first episode is called The Band of Peace, and it's looking at these 22 pyramids that are in the six distinct sites, speculating about how they could have been used, and then it grows and progresses into high-level technology. And we're looking at some instruments that there's absolutely no way they could have been made with chisels. Um, I don't even know if we could create something like the Schist Dix today that is just absolutely so refined. But we've got high-definition footage of all of these instruments and speculations about how they could have been used. Uh, the third episode is called Sacred Cosmology, and it goes into the we go on um, an expedition in the desert to a very ancient site called Napta Playa, and that has astrological astronomical mm -hmm. alignments that are similar to what came later in pharaonic times. Now, what's ironic and sad about that is that since we took that footage, the site has had quite a bit of damage from people just driving jeeps right over the top of the microlithic stones. And I don't know that anybody had taken high-definition footage of it in the first place. So, you know, when you think that some of the footage we have, the sites have been destroyed, it's, it's pretty spectacular that we managed. I mean, I think if we started over again right now, it would be impossible to get it get some of that stuff. And then the Sacred Cosmology episode goes into 
what did they know in terms of science? And we have Laird Scranton who's talking about uh, new interpretations of hieroglyphic that take, goes a step beyond what Champollion had reported way back. And he was one of Napoleon's um, men. And it's not that Champollion was wrong, it's just that there's multiple layers of meaning and it can go deeper than that. And that gives an explanation of just how sophisticated they were. They understood string theory. They understood the Calais Biao space, which is something that uh, physicists are just starting to grasp. And Laird Scranton talks about if you go to Stephen Hawking and ask him how many uh, levels there are in the quantum string theory, he'll say about 200. And if you go to a Dogon priest, he'll say 266. So it's, it's fascinating that this knowledge has been preserved. He's speculating that... Uh, the Dogons may have been a class of priests that left Egypt during the the Islamic takeover because they didn't want to be exposed to that. And they migrated all the way over to Mali in East Africa and they kept the traditions alive, they kept the the way they spoke alive and the symbols alive and they relate directly to the hieroglyphic text. So that's pretty exciting stuff. The fourth episode is called The Empowered Human and that's looking at how the ancients would have had 360 senses, much, much higher levels of consciousness and how that functioned. So who they were and what they were doing. So what I'm trying to do is, is paint a sociocultural, spiritual context mm-hmm. for who we might have been in a golden age. So it's not just saying we had a lot of, they had a lot of stuff. It's basically saying that there was, there was a rhyme and a reason and a training and a way that they were able to access these higher levels of consciousness. And the last episode is a new chronology, which is saying, okay, well, if this is possible, when was it possible? Because looking in recent history in 2450 BC, when they say the pyramids were built, it it just doesn't add up. There's too many problems with it. Now, the other thing is that we've had a couple of world floods since, you know, the ancient, ancient times. Yes. And so when they say, well, if they had diamond drill bits, where are they? Well, you know, a little tiny diamond drill bit isn't going to survive two floods and 50,000 years or however long it was. So we have to, you know, really think in different terms in, in, in terms of how do we prove it. And so we bring in the concept of archaeoastronomy. And so, you know, and that is... A, so one of the things that I'm bringing in as well is a multidisciplinary approach. Now, what patriarchal ways of being and thinking have done is divided and conquered. So university uh, departments don't speak to one another. And so geology can't speak to large cycles of time and weather patterns and doesn't speak to linguistics. And you know what I'm saying? It, you know, when you get you know, little clues and crumbs from astrophysicists and from geologists and archaeologists and anthropologists, then you can start to weave a larger story together. But you know, one of the things about the way formal research is conducted on the Giza Plateau is it has to be archaeologists from Egypt and if you're an anthropologist, you can't get the permits, and they divide it all up. So, you know, it's a really big puzzle that we're putting together, and that's what the contribution that the Pyramid Code, I think, is hopefully making. And so it's stretching us to think of things in a different way, and I think that if, you know, people were high-level initiates and are reincarnated from there, they're probably going to watch it and go, I knew it. <laughs> so it really is meant to be a trigger to those who already know. And it's pretty exciting, you know, because it's also, you know, got an original soundtrack and it's, it's very uh, easy to watch whether, whether you know it already or not. So it appeals to a large audience. But it's also building scaffolding so that we can hang a different perspective of what the Egyptians might have been. You believe that the Nile ran alongside the pyramids. Tell me about this, and, and how did you conclude this? Well, you've, you've talked to Hakim, I think, as well, and he's an indigenous mm-hmm. wisdom keeper that passed away a year ago, and uh, I studied with him for 12 years, and he insisted on the idea of the migration of the Nile. Now, we've got aerial footage in the Pyramid Code, and I've spent a lot of time digging around on the plateau myself, and you can see where the riverbed would have gone. And you can also see when you look at Google Earth how the edge of the plateau and and the fertile band along the Nile is exactly parallel to where the Nile has migrated now eight miles away. But if you look further west, 
where you get the El Cargo Oasis and Docklow Oasis and all of that, it also is roughly parallel. And so we can think 